We were contacted by a family who had a relative go missing in 1930 and ever since then they've uh, believed that their missing relative may have been the victim in a very famous murder case in Northampton, the Blazing Car Murder. Um, the perpetrator in that case was eventually convicted but the victim in the car was never identified. So the family was doing some research about the family history and this story and they contacted Northamptonshire Police for more information about the case and through the police they were put in contact with John Bond and myself to see if perhaps we could help them answer some of these questions. So William's my, was my great great uncle. He was born in 1907. His mother and father were Thomas and Alice Briggs. He grew up in London. He was 23 at the time he disappeared and it's only recently that um, I've been through the family keepsakes and found newspaper clippings and letters that my great aunts have written trying to reopen the murder case. So you can see it says Rav's murder case recalled. That's a picture of William. So getting the answer to this would mean closure for my family. Um, certainly early on direct relatives really struggled to come to terms with the disappearance of William and it's only with more recent generations of the family that it's really been a true murder mystery and now I think we just want the answer. A lot of peace, a lot of peace, yeah, if we got some answers it would settle a lot of things, definitely. The first thing we did when we were asked to investigate this case was to visit Northamptonshire Police Headquarters to go through the case files from the time and any remaining artefacts that might have been from the murder scene. When we arrived at the archives we were uh, delighted to find that there was quite a few um, things still in the case files including lots of documentation that the police took at the time which first of all showed us that the police had done quite a thorough investigation to try and, and solve this case. Some of the documents that were in the police files included some eyewitness accounts. There was two eyewitnesses on the night of the murder who were walking back from a bonfire night party and came across a gentleman who was leaving Hardingston Lane uh, in a bit of a hurry carrying a leather case. Um, and when he passed them, they realized that from where he was walking from, there was a large bonfire. And when they investigated what the bonfire was, it turned out to be a car on fire. Now at that point they couldn't see if anyone was in the car, um, but they reported it to the police and that is how this, this crime was initially reported. So the eyewitness accounts are in there and we now know that the man that they saw leaving Hardingston Lane was Alfred Rouse, who was eventually yeah. convicted uh, for the murder. All that has survived. Over here. Also in the police files were some uh, bits of evidence that were recovered from the crime scene. So once the fire was successfully put out, the police recovered a large wooden mallet in the grass uh, about 14 yards from the car. And that mallet, they believe, was used to render the victim unconscious before the fire in the car was set. In addition, there was a box of debris from the fire, so some debris that had been swept out of the car and was still at police archives in a box. So we were able to go through that and just get a sense of the kind of debris that was in the car after the fire was put out. That was like a buttonhole. Yeah, for, yeah. For a, a pair of braces, I should think, maybe. Going through the police archived case files was very useful for putting this crime into some context and understanding how the police investigation was carried out, and also for corroborating some of the things that the family told us um, about their missing relative um, in relation to this crime. However, there was nothing, no physical evidence available in the case files that we could use to definitively link the family to the victim in this crime. Fortunately, we were informed by one of the family that they had identified the existence of two microscope slides taken by Sir Bernard Spilsbury during his post-mortem of tissue from the deceased. And these slides were still in existence and located at an archive at the hospital in London. Well, today we've come to the Royal London Hospital Museum archives because this is where all of the remaining slides from Sir Bernard Spielberg's career are now stored for safekeeping. The reason slides like this would have been taken at a post-mortem back in 1930 was really for medical reasons to actually look for any factors that could have contributed to the death of the deceased other than being murdered. So routine pathological slides would be taken in any post-mortem. 
In addition, because this was a criminal investigation, from what we've seen today here at the Royal London Hospital, Sir Bernard seems to have taken at least two slides specifically to try and assist the police in their investigation. Uh, Labelled prostate identification of sex, which is the one that you're most interested in. Yes. And the other one is a, a lung specimen. So once we had possession of the slide, we needed to find a laboratory that could undertake mitochondrial DNA analysis and we approached Northumbria University Centre for Forensic Science and they agreed to undertake the DNA work for us to remove the covered glass and to mitochondrial profile the tissue that was left behind on it. A big issue with this slide is that we need to get at the tissue that is now over 80 years old and protected beneath a cover glass. So we need to be able to remove the cover glass without damaging the tissue that's underneath. And it's also possible that when this slide was made up back in 1930, that it could have been innocently contaminated by the person who made the slide up. In those days, there was no such thing as DNA analysis, so no precautions would have been taken in the making up of the slide, so it's possible it might be contaminated by the person who made it up. Fortunately, from the slide, we were able to obtain a single male profile and a mitochondrial profile for that individual. So we now have the DNA of the victim from this murder. So the next step would be to see if we can link that DNA to DNA from the family. So now that we've confirmed that there was in fact DNA on the autopsy slide, uh, we then invited the family back to the University of Leicester to take some samples from the family members, which we can then use to compare with the DNA from the, the tissue on the slide. So the family visited the university and we took some cheek swabs from them using um, some swabbing kits, um, which basically just involves um, rubbing a swab on the inside of your cheek in order to get some skin cells which will contain DNA that we can then extract and compare to the sample from the autopsy. Once we had the comparison and we then knew whether their missing relative was or wasn't the deceased in the burnt out vehicle, we needed to tell the family. So we invited the family members to come back to the University of Leicester and we sat them around a the table and we discussed with them how the results were obtained and then revealed the result itself and explained how the conclusions that we'd come to were derived and why they were scientifically justified. We have just sat down with the family and explained to them the results of the DNA analysis and the report that outlines the findings. The first thing the report concluded is that it was in fact a single male profile of DNA that was recovered from the slide and also that this DNA was not contaminated with the DNA of a second individual. However, the findings have also excluded William Briggs as the source of the DNA on the autopsy slide, which means William Briggs was not the victim um, of the blazing car murder. Obviously the family are somewhat disappointed that we weren't able to give them any definitive answers as to what happened to William the night he went missing, but they are thankful that they were able to finally get an answer about whether or not he was the victim in this case. This case is a great example of the kind of work that we do here at the University of Leicester and also our capabilities which are made possible by academic expertise and also an extensive network of collaborators. We were able to work with this family to answer some questions that they've had for over 80 years. And although we weren't able to give them any definitive answer about what happened to William Briggs the night he went missing, we were able to confirm for them that he was not the victim in the Northampton blazing car murder.